Only in one case, Selman v. Harrison, 2002, did the Supreme Court take a different view on the meaning of the constitutional right to freedom of religion. In this case, the court upheld a school voucher program in Cleveland, Ohio, giving financial aid to parents to allow them to send their children to religious or private schools. In December 2000, the Federal Court of Appeals had declared the Ohio program to be unconstitutional because it had the effect of promoting sectarian, that is, religious schools, and thereby violated the Establishment Clause of the First Amendment. But the five-member majority of the Supreme Court disagreed. Writing for the majority, Chief Justice William Rehnquist stated, The question is whether Ohio is coercing parents into sending their children to religious schools. And that question must be answered, evaluating all options Ohio provides Cleveland school children with, only one of which is to obtain a voucher and then choose a religious school. But what the court was doing in all of these cases was updating the phrases of the First Amendment, written in 1791 and trying to apply them out to the modern-day American society. The first 16 words of the American First Amendment remain the same, but their meaning has been significantly changed by the decisions of the Supreme Court. And that sense, and in that sense, the court has the power and has used the power to amend the US Constitution through interpretation. Freedom of speech. The First Amendment goes on to guarantee what it calls freedom of speech, stating this freedom shall not be abridged. But what constitutes freedom of speech? Does one have the right to shout fire in a crowded theatre? Curiously enough, that much used question is used in itself in this quotation from a Supreme Court decision in Shank v. United States. The early 20th century case revolved around whether Charles Schenck and other members of the American Socialist Party had violated the 1917 Espionage Act, which prohibited the obstruction of military uh, recruiting, or whether their anti-war pamphlets were protected by the First Amendment's right to free speech. In finding against Schenck and upholding the Espionage, Espionage Act, Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes, writing for the unanimous majority, in this historic case, argued in words that gave rise to not just one famous phrase, but two. The most stringent protection of free speech would not protect a man falsely shouting fire in a theatre and causing a panic. The question in every case is whether the words used in such circumstances are such such a nature as to create a clear and present danger that they will be bring about the substantive evils that Congress has a right to prevent. So, in, in 1919, the court ruled that the First Amendment did not cover Communist Party anti-war literature. Since then, the court has turned its attention to more main, mainstream manif manifestations of free speech. Do limits on political campaign contributions and expenditure limit free speech? In Buckley v. Vallejo, 1976, the court decided that parts of the 1974 Federal Election Campaign Act did just that and declared them unconstitutional. In Rankin v. McPherson in 1987, uh, the court upheld the free speech of Ardeth McPherson. Uh, after she had been sacked for remarking at her workplace the day after the unsuccessful assassination attempt on President, President Reagan in 1981. If they go for him again, I hope they get him. Then there were the flag-burning decisions, Texas versus Johnson, 1989, and United States versus Eichmann, 1990, in which this court struck down both a Texas state law and a federal law banning flag-burning. Writing for the majority in the Johnson decision, Justice Brennan, William Brennan, wrote, now, There is a bedrock principle underlying the First Amendment. It is that the government may not prohibit the expression of an idea simply because society finds the idea itself offensive or disagreeable. 
One can be fairly sure that when the framers wrote the First Amendment, they did not have the protection of flag burning in mind. But the Supreme Court in the late 20th century decided that this is what it meant today, and by doing so, in effect, amended the Constitution. In the 1997 case of Reno versus American Civil Liberties Union, the court extended the First Amendment protection of free speech to the internet when it declared unconstitutional the 1996 Communications Decency Act. The court struck down the act because of its vague phraseology, banning anything on the internet that was indecent or patently offensive. The First Amendment goes digital, proclaimed the Washington Post. Writing for the majority, or seven-member majority in the case, Justice Paul Stevens stated, The Communications Decency Act, the CDA, lacks the precision that the First Amendment requires when a statute regulates the content of speech. In order to deny minors access to potentially harmful speech, the CDA effectively suppresses a large amount of speech that adults have a constitutional right to receive and to address to one another. In the 2002 case, of Water, Watchtower Bible and Tract Society of New York versus Village of Stratton, Ohio, the Supreme Court sought to protect yet another set of free speech rights, the right to visit door-to-door -door in a neighborhood. The small town of Stratton, Ohio had passed a law requiring anyone visiting door-to-door -to, -door to get a permit beforehand. The law was challenged by the Jehovah's Witnesses, whose members are renowned for their door-to-door -door visiting. Writing for the eight-member majority, Justice Stevens stated, It is offensive, not only to the values of the First Amendment, but to the very notion of a free society, that in the context of everyday public discourse, a citizen must first inform the government of his or her desire to speak to his or her neighbors and then obtain a permit to do so. An area of First Amendment rights much in contention today is the area of what we call political speech. This has become an even more vexed question following the restrictions on campaign finance by the 2002 Bipartisan Campaign Reform Act of 2002. In McConnell versus Federal Election Commission 2003, the court upheld the provisions of the act and so rejected the argument of its opponents that in banning soft money, that's unregulated money given to political parties by individuals for grassroots organizing, uh, get out of vote uh, drivers and issue adverts, the law stifles free speech and was therefore contrary to the principles of the First Amendment. Justice Antonin Scalia, writing for the minority in a 5 to 4 decision, complained Who could have imagined that the same court which, within the past years, has sternly disapproved restrictions upon virtual child pornography, tobacco advertising, and sexually explicit cable television program? would smile in favour upon a law that cuts to the heart of what the First Amendment is meant to be about and protect, the right to criticise the government. But four years later, in Federal Election Commission versus Wisconsin, right to life, the court struck down a key element of the BCRA as being a violation of the free speech guarantee of the First Amendment. The court struck down the Act's ban on business corporation and labour union sponsorship of television advertisements unless they explicitly urge a voter for or against a particular candidate in federal elections in the 30 days before a primary or 60 days before a general election. Discussion of issues cannot be suppressed simply because the issues may also be pertinent to an election, wrote Chief Justice Roberts with a five-member majority. Then in 2010, the court went even further. In Citizens United versus Federal Election Commission, the court struck down all limits on pre-election uh, ads allowing even those ads that explicitly urged a vote for one or another candidate. It further rendered a 63-year-old ban on corporations using money from their general funds to produce and run their own political campaign adverts. Again, it was a 5-4 to four ruling that the Conservatives joined by swing justice Anthony Kennedy. Authoring the majority opinion, Kennedy had this to say about the First Amendment freedom of speech. When government seeks to use its full power, including the criminal law, the command where a person may get his or her information, or what distrusted source he or she may not hear, it uses censorship to control thought. Thus, these phrases from the First Amendment have been amended, updated, by the court 
to apply to circumstances that have been quite unforeseeable by those who wrote the Constitution. The Second Amendment. The case of District Columbia versus Heller, 2008, was the Supreme Court's great landmark decision on the meaning of the Second Amendment's right to keep and bear arms. The case centered on a gun law introduced in Washington, D.C. in 1976, which banned the ownership of handguns and required that shotguns and rifles be kept in the owner's home, unloaded and dismantled or bound by a trigger lock. Writing for the court's five-member majority, Justice Antonin Scalia stated, we hold that the district's ban on handgun possession in the home violates the Second Amendment, as does the prohibition against rendering any lawful firearm in the home operable for the purpose of immediate self-defense. The Second Amendment surely elevates above all other interests the right of law-abiding, responsible citizens to use arms in defense of hearth and home. Scalia was joined by his fellow Conservative Justices, John Roberts, Clarence Thomas and Sam Alito, as well as by Swing Justice Anthony Kennedy. Writing for the court's dissenting minority, Justice Stephen Breyer claimed that the decision threatens to throw into doubt the constitutionality of gun laws throughout the United States, calling the decision a formidable and potentially dangerous mission for the courts to undertake. He was joined by Liberal colleagues John Paul Stevens, David Souter and Ruth Bader Ginsburg. What does the Second Amendment actually say about the right to carry uh, arms? The wording as well as the punctuation is curious. A well-regulated militia, comma, being necessary to the security of a free state, comma, the right of the people to keep and bear arms, comma, shall not be infringed, full stop. So what does it mean? Is it a guarantee of a right to form a well-regulated militia, a collective right to keep and bear arms? Liberals, Democrats and friends of the Brady campaign to prevent gun violence have taken the former view. Conservatives, Republicans and paired up members of the National Rifle Association have taken the latter view. And with the exception of a rather obscure ruling back in 1939 in the case of United States versus Miller, the Supreme Court has pretty much kept out of the debate. So how did the justices arrive at such differing conclusions about the meaning of 27 words? First, we need to divide the Second Amendment into two clauses, what we might call the preface, a well-regulated militia being necessary to the security of a free state, and the operative clause, the right of the people to keep and bear arms shall not be infringed. Justice Scalia, for the majority, concluded that the preface does not limit or expand the scope of the operative clause, but grants to each individual the right to bear arms. And this right is not a collective one linked to joining militia. He drew attention to the fact that the First, Fourth and Ninth Amendments all refer to individual rights and not to collective rights, exercised only through participation in some corporate body. But Justice Stevens, for the minority, believed that the preface's mention of a well-regulated militia meant that the right to bear arms is tied to service in a militia. He pointed out that the majority were restricting the meaning of the Second Amendment by limiting it to law-abiding responsible citizens. The two sides then went on to debate the meaning of the phrase to keep and bear arms. Justice Scalia stated that the most natural reading of keep arms is to have weapons. He believed that keep arms was simply a common way in the 18th century when the amendment was formulated of referring to possessing arms, both for militiamen and, and everyone else. But Justice Stevens took a different view. A number of state militia laws in effect at the time of the amendment's drafting used the term keep to describe the requirement that the militia members store their arms in their homes, ready to be used for service when necessary. For Justice Stevens, the term bear arms was a familiar idiom meaning to serve as a soldier, do military service, fight, as defined by the Oxford English Dictionary. But what we saw in District of Columbia versus Heller was another example of the Supreme Court amending the Constitution by interpretation. For as a result of this judgment, the court announced for the first time that the Second Amendment right to bear arms is an individual right. Yet another example of the court telling us what 18th century words mean today in the 21st century. And in that sense, another example of the court's ability to amend the Constitution. The Eighth Amendment. After much debate, 
and indeed very debated part of the U.S. Constitution, has been the Eighth Amendment, which states briefly, Excessive bail shall not be required, nor excessive fines imposed, nor cruel and unusual punishments inflicted. It is the last six words of this amendment, the prohibition against cruel and unusual punishments, that has been the centre of the Court's attention since its landmark decision of Furman v. Georgia in 1972. There seems little doubt that the framers of the amendment back in the 1790s were just as comfortable with capital punishment as they were with slavery and all an all-male electorate. They would not have dreamed that the methods of execution used in the 1970s, such as the electric chair, uh, not that the concept of an electric chair would have meant very much in the 18th century, could constitute a cruel punishment. But that is essentially what the court decided in its 1972 decision. Not only, ruled the court, was the method cruel, but the way in which executions were handed out was arbitrary and unfair, or in the vocabulary of the 18th century, unusual. Indeed, if we look at the death penalty decisions by the court, we can clearly see how the court is amending the concept of cruel punishments to keep in line with the accepted views of the American society at any given time. In Wilkerson v. Utah in 1888, the court had concluded that execution by hanging or firing squad, the most used of methods at the time, was passable by the Eighth Amendment, but that dissecting or burning alive would not constitute uh, an acceptable constitutional action. But a hundred years later, the court was not only outlawing the use of the electric chair, but also declaring the tooth in 2002, Atkins versus Virginia, that the execution of mentally retarded criminals was unconstitutional, as was the execution of those who committed their crimes when under 18 years of age, Roper versus Simmons, 2005. In 2008, the court was asked to rule on whether Kentucky's practice of execution by lethal injection constituted a cruel punishment. The court decided that it did not. However, in the opinion of Justices Clarence Thomas and Antonin Scalia, in this case, the arguments put forward by the majority were erroneous. They argued it was very clear from precedent-setting cases such as Wilkerson v. Utah that an execution method violates the Eighth Amendment only if it is deliberately designed to inflict pain. Judged under that standard, they argued that this was an easy case because it is undisputed that Kentucky adopted its lethal injection protocol in an effort to make capital punishment more humane, not to add elements of terror, pain or disgrace. Here again, therefore, the court, through its power of judicial review, has updated, amended, as it were, the meaning of the Eighth Amendment ban on cruel and unusual punishments. As in other areas of constitutional law, the Supreme Court has used and tried to reflect an ever-changing society in the way it has reinterpreted the meaning of words now over 200 years old. The 14th Amendment. The 14th Amendment dates from 1868, just three years after the end of the Civil War. It defines citizenship, restricts the power of the states in their relations with their inhabitants, and most importantly forbids a state from depriving any person of life, liberty or property without due process of law, and from denying to any person the equal protection of the law. Since its enactment, it has caused extensive controversy over what the framers intended and how the Supreme Court has applied it. The Equal Protection Clause, for example, has been used by the court to restrain racial segregation, to maintain fair apportionment for state legislative districts, to gain equal justice for the poor, and to gain equal treatment for women. But its most famous and controversial setting was probably the 1973 decision of Roe v. Wade. In what was one of the most important decisions made by the Supreme Court in the 20th century, the court interpreted the right of liberty in the 14th Amendment to encompass a woman's right to choose to have an abortion. The relevant part of the amendment is what is usually referred to as the due 